I am Rob. <laughs> and you guys are back in the office. That's a good sign too. Yes, uh, we do uh, COVID testing every Monday. We have a nice portion of our of our uh, employees who've been vaccinated. Our meta mobility business is a very big uh, business. So we through lockdown, we worked with all the local hospitals, for organ movements, equipment movements, doctor moving doctors around. So uh, we had to do protocols very early. Um, you know, we had a skeleton staff during that, but now we're probably uh, at uh, not full capacity, but you know. A good number of people here. Excellent. How big is the company right now in terms of total employees? Uh, I think we're about uh, full time 30, but we swell with part time employees up to 80, you know, okay. peak periods. Uh, so, um, you know, we're very lean, uh, which is great. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with the fact that, as you probably know, we're asset light. We don't own or operate any right. aircraft, which is part of our transition, how we're going to be able to transition to what we call EVA, electric vertical aircraft, or some of your uh, uh, your subscribers may view as uh, uh, EVTOL. Yep, absolutely. So, I mean, I, I call you guys an urban mobility company. Yeah. Um, is that how you still describe yourselves? Yeah, we view ourselves as an urban air mobility company. That's the name. It's Blade Urban Air Mobility. And, um, you know, to just kind of go off that, you know, we've obviously met a lot of investors, you know, over this whole process. And, um, you know, we are using helicopters today, but we are transitioning using the platform that we have of a network of uh, 12 lounges, including three and in, in India, actually three term, uh, 12 terminals, uh, you know, a, a, a cockpit to consumer um, technology stack, uh, that does everything from booking to logistics on the operator end to accounting software, accounting dashboards, not unlike, say, your big client of Walmart, check-in at these terminals, which have become really, really critical. Uh, and even in cockpit for the uh, helicopter pilot where they can see the weight and um, uh, conduct weight and bounds uh, uh, calculations based on the manifest and the weights of the passengers. So, you know, so we're using existing infrastructure with helicopters today because essentially the entire ecosystem around it, everything from processing passengers to booking to, um, you know, logistics and uh, uh, with our operators, you know, using geo data exhaust and others to figure out how to load balance different terminals and how to schedule flights and pricing. All of this is going to stay the same. So, you know, one analogy that resonates with a lot of people is if you, if you think about Netflix, they didn't call it DVDs in a bag. <laughs> the company first came out, but they knew that if they had a great brand, which they did, a lot of consumers, which they did, and a great service, when streaming became really available, it was an easy transition and it was a cohabitation phase. And it's the same thing for Blade. Um, you know, we, uh, we have a great brand. We have 200,000 users about and pre pandemic. We had 40,000 uh, uh, flyers uh, and in fact, over a run rate of over 20,000, just going to airports at 195 uh, shattering the Uber black ground price. Uh, with 195 or $95 than the airport pass. So going back to that Netflix analogy, you know, they made that transition. Now there were people who waited for streaming like Apple Plus and, you know, Disney for sure, but Netflix is doing okay. And so what our view is we want this entire ecosystem and there are over a hundred different airframes that are available and we're talking to manufacturers every single day. And so at some What's, point- uh, when, when you say airframe, what do you mean by that? Well, they, a new uh, EVA. So okay. there are companies out there building electric vertical aircraft. And I think that, you know, for some of your subscribers and watchers, um, this whole concept of flying car or air taxi really doesn't do justice to the market because these aren't, you know, calling these new aircraft a flying car is like calling a helicopter a flying car. You know, we can land at pre-existing uh, airports and heliports. And part of our strategy is to use our capital to both acquire them and to build the proprietary infrastructure that we have. So right now, 
uh, almost all our blade terminals, only blade passengers can go in there, which is really important because we can have hundreds of people going through in an hour. We need to check them in. We need to do security. We do health and safety, including blood oxygen saturation. We do electrostatic decontamination between every flight from what with our staff on the going on the tarmac. Aggregating these people with the right bags, making sure they're checked and they've done their health and safety. You need physical space to do that. You need a terminal. And most of these airports, as you can imagine, and heliports were really meant for, you know, kind of a guy coming in and, you know, on a private aircraft or a helicopter and they all know each other. We right. take six to nine people who don't know each other and put them on the same aircraft. Uh, so that, you know, these terminals have become really a proprietary moat for us in certain key markets. Uh, and we recently announced with our sponsor uh, of our, uh, our of the company we're merging into, uh, they own Ross Aviation. One of the reasons, you, one of your questions is like, why did you decide to go public by SPAC? You know, a lot of it was a sponsor. The sponsor owned Ross Aviation, a very big company that owns FBOs. So we always wanted to do commuter service from Westchester, kind of Greenwich area, Greenwich, Connecticut, to Manhattan. Right. But we could never position an aircraft there. And now with Ross, we're now opening our second terminal in Westchester. They also have the ability, they also have uh, facilities in Palm Springs that help us with LA to Palm Springs. They have Bedford, Massachusetts, which is a nice suburb to Boston, which will help us with leisure markets like Nantucket and Hyannis. And so what we're doing is we keep building this company uh, using conventional aircraft. And at some point, because the airframe manufacturers, their first machines are gonna only be able to work on one specific mission. We require a portfolio approach. In other words, the same uh, uh, helicopter that moves in Oregon for Langone is different than the one that you might take to the airport, which is different than the one that you might fly to Boston. The same thing will be true for EVA or electric vertical aircraft. And because each manufacturer is now coming out with their first aircraft, they're not all right for every mission. And they, they're probably a lot of them going to have you know, limited battery life, limited capacity, uh, you know, uh, there, there are going to be a lot of different re you know, reasons of what kind of missions they're right for. So we may still be taking you by helicopter to Boston, but taking you to the airport and EVA. That's why we think okay. our model, you know, really works well. And then we can, so in a way, we're an index play on these aircraft manufacturers because we, we don't know who's going to win. Right. So you're kind of the transportation tech layer for all of them. Well, the, it's the it's the a big part. Of the, well, the tech layer. Remember, it's not a marketplace. We have 29 operators. Uh, they are highly vetted by our head of safety. Everything from hours on an airframe, maintenance logs, pilot hours, you know, FAA diligence, you know, financial wherewithal. They have to use our branding, understand our customer service. So they're integrated into our system. Uh, and so, you know, what we really provide is not only the tech layer. We have these operator relationships. We have the the terminals, which is really uh, important, and then the brand, and then the flyers. So if EVA takes a longer time, we're just going to keep getting bigger and flying more people. The brand gets that stronger. If you know, and maybe you can say, you know, the discount rate goes down. If EVA comes earlier, our TAM goes up. In other words, the places we land right now. Some are 38 years old, some are 100 years old. They're not building any more infrastructure because helicopters are loud. And one of the most important things that we get with this new technology is quiet, zero emissions, and, uh, you know, hopefully safer, right? And so and that will allow us to then, if I, if I pick you up a block from your house or your apartment, that's much more valuable to you than you driving 20 minutes to Rafael. And that's why the TAM goes up like that. So I know you guys have been mostly focused on the New York metro area, right? Because that's where you have a lot of money. You have a lot of people commuting from Greenwich into New York, going from New York to the Hamptons. Is that right? Well, I would say airport in New York, which is a huge addressable market, I believe 27 million uh, people who we deem are, you know, have the financial wherewithal, either rent cars or uh, use, you know, Ubers, the high-end Ubers, and have the economic wherewithal, and who, who either go into New York City airports to go to Manhattan or go from Manhattan to New York City airports is a huge addressable market. But obviously, you know, we have the whole Northeast corridor is probably the largest revenue short-distance market 
in the world. Okay, so when you think about Philadelphia, Boston, DC, we're also working obviously on the West Coast and we now fly in India between Mumbai, Shirdi and Mahalakshmi, uh, which, you know, with, besides having billions of people has a unique high, you know, uh, real wealth class that find this affordable and the we're turning six hour drives into half hour flights there. Wow. And over here, we're turning two hour drives to the airport to five minute flights. Yeah, if, now, no one's ever, if no one's ever sat in traffic between Manhattan and one of the airports, they may not appreciate how long it can take <laughs> and, <laughs> or how, and, and how expensive it is. You're sitting in a taxi cab and the, the, the meter just keeps on cranking. And right now we're basically, according to Port Authority, at near pre-pandemic levels for traffic. Uh, there are a lot of people leaving mass transit. And, and so I, I think that, you know, we got help get rid of the indulgence factors of helicopters. We made it non-intimidating. Uh, they know your mission. So what I mean by that is when you walk in and you check in, they know if your God forbid, your, your aircraft is late or there's a mechanical or there's a switch. We also have in the past, all weather guarantee partners. So for whatever reason, you have a longer mission and your flights canceled for inclement weather because you know obviously safety is our priority. Uh, we will actually put you in a car of one of our brand partners, which to them is the world's longest test drive. They love it. And for without any additional cost, drive you to your ultimate destination and your next flight is free. So uh, it really is, and we, we keep the cash and then you have a credit for your next flight. So it seems to be working with there are a lot of other markets. We just announced a deal in Chicago, where the number three city in the country where uh, we are rebranding the uh, Chicago Vertiport with the blade name. And we're gonna start with helicopters focused on metamobility, which is one of our fastest growing businesses, which is moving organs you know, between hospitals for transplant patients. And then we're gonna be assessing that market to see uh, you know, how, how it could work in terms of airport transfers and other things. So we, you know, we're definitely in expansion mode. We're looking forward to getting this capital to keep building this network of terminals. And we think when these EVA are, are here, this is a really important point, these new pieces of equipment will be using the existing infrastructure. We have a lot of throw weight because we control a lot of these terminals. And there'll be a period of maybe five years, hopefully less, where we go to the stakeholders like local legislators, city councils, uh, uh, local residents and say, hey, we would like to build a vertiport more convenient to others. It's quiet, it's safe, it's carbon, uh, zero carbon emissions. And here, take a look at it. We were showing you, so in other words, to prove it to everybody, once it's here, we will be using our existing infrastructure and that's where we'll get the catalyst for cities to believe if they want to really become city 2.0, vertiports have to be part of their future. And in the beginning, it's not landing on top of buildings. It's not $40 flights. It's not the Jetsons. You got to look at it as, you really have to look at EVA as quiet, zero emission helicopter. When EVA is here, are you guys going to stay asset light or are you going to, okay, so you're not going to own the great EVA? Question. It's a great question. You know, we are asset light, but the manufacturers actually work with us because we can represent between 70 and 100% of the missions of a lot of our operators. So to give you an example, if, uh, you know, in 2019, where we experienced a tremendous amount of growth, when one of our operators wanted to purchase a new Bell 407, you know, we get a call from Textron saying, hey, how many hours do you think you could do on it? These guys want to buy this, uh, you know, aircraft. Do you think you can do how many hours? And they finance off our back. Okay. And so we think the same, we're going to probably engage in the same type of discussions with manufacturers because obviously they'll be announcing financing, uh, you know, uh, as well. Or we could also, you know, based on hourly commitments, we can help them understand what they feel comfortable financing. So we represent sometimes with some of our leading operators between 70 and 100% of their business being on the Blade platform. But it's not like an Uber in the sense that every Uber you get into is different. The driver has a different driving skill. Uh, his level of communication in your native language may be different. The type of car, cleanliness, safety, all this, you know, you just basically download the app. You know, it's not People, this is not the gig economy. You know, we're dealing with former military, former NYPD, former corporate uh, pilots, and you can't just kind of put a, 
a phone on a suction cup and a helicopter in your backyard and say, hey, let's try to make a couple bucks this weekend. You know, these are 29 operators, which allows us to have a consistency of service and a level of safety and a level of uh, uh, reliability that you really can't do when you're so big. So if I knew that I was going to be doing a lot of commuting to New York, uh, flying into the airports from Boston and then taking a helicopter into the city, I assume there is some sort of a sign up process that I would go through, uh, background checks or whatnot. So how, how long does that process take? To- no, you can book within 15 minutes. Wow. Okay. Right? So you, you know, the call, and that's one of the things the old, before blade, there were no brands. You had to fill five out. You, you had to fill out uh, five page contracts. Used to be, you had to fax them. You had to wire money. And now you just go on the blade app and you can use Apple pay. You can be flying in 20 minutes, depending wow. on the schedule. Uh, we do do uh, for certain type of flights or no fly lists. We do, you know, obviously our checking IDs and, you know, we have our own private systems of, of things we teach our people in order to, you know, maintain the safety and the, you know, and we teach, you know, our, uh, uh, our what we call our FX staff, the flyer experience staff are on the ground to look for people and deal with bag issues. And, you know, they're, they, they're pretty smart about it. We did hire consultants to help us on the safety side. And it's something we think about every day, you know, safety on the ground, that is. And also safety on the ground is really important in terms of walking on the tarmac. You know, a very high percentage of accidents with helicopters are not in the air. There are people walking, unfortunately, behind the helicopter or don't understand how to approach a helicopter. So our staff is trained and actually walk people out to the helicopter, help them with four-point seatbelts, help them with, you know, anything else that they would need. So if we fast forward three years, how many of the major airports in the U.S. do you think Blade will be at? We'll have. Well, I I think, you know, look, it's really all about friction. You know, it's very interesting you mentioned that because, you know, a lot of our investors say or people who are interested in investing say, I don't understand. Like you guys, you know, know, you're in some key markets in New York, key markets in the United States. You know, we understand what your plans are for the West Coast, the East Coast. Now you have Chicago. Why did you go to India? Why not London? Why not Paris? You know, the bottom line is right now there's no place to land. If, you know, there's one heliport, Battersea heliport. If I fly you from Heathrow to Battersea heliport, literally, that's like if you understand New York, that's like me saying I'll fly you from JFK airport to Manhattan, and instead I fly you from JFK airport to LaGuardia and put you in a cab. So it just doesn't exist. You know, the infrastructure doesn't work. And by the way, the Heathrow Express and the Gatwick Express in London are fantastic. So that's a market, despite the fact. We know the brand travels really well there, you know, and the same thing with Paris. There aren't existing places to land. India, we got permission to build heliports. We went from signing to flying in nine months. So you guys do that yourselves rather than a joint venture? It was a joint venture with a local partner. It's a very good question. We had very, very good relationships with the Ministry of Aviation, got permission to build terminals, helipads. And, you know, and they're very aggressive because, you, as you can imagine, the infrastructure in Mumbai, in India, is really, really weak. And we've all seen the pictures of the highways, if you want to call them that, where it's, you know, backed up for miles and miles, eight cars wide. So, you know, the analysis that McKinsey did, the, uh, uh, I think the average, it may not have been McKinsey, but the average a, a person who commutes in Mumbai spends 250 hours a year in traffic. God. Wow. So, uh, you know, so look, we think it's a great opportunity. Our job is to reduce friction, but to do it on a cost effective basis. So we look at when we analyze new markets, uh, you know, exactly what we just said in, you know, Mumbai to Shirdi, five hour drive to half hour flight, uh, New York to JFK, up to two hour drive, uh, five minute flight, beat, try to beat Uber Black. Uh, and so you can get rid of this indulgence factor, uh, work on, how about LA, right? I mean, everyone always complains about LA traffic. That's gotta be a, a market at some point. Yeah. And, and I think that LA is great. We have an op- we have a rooftop lounge and the, the only rooftop heliport in the United States in downtown LA, but there's some missing pieces there. There's West Hollywood, there's Century City and we're working on that. Those are critical pieces that, you know, you still need to get, but again, you know, and also we started working hard on enterprise. So Forget the 195, you can fly for $95 if you have an airport pass that you pay $795 a year for. So uh, what a lot we do with enterprise with big companies is you start at the top and like, I'm not sure I want my people to have, you know, using helicopters, but 
and then they realize they're not even using Ubers or spending over $200. Oh, for sure. Video car services or these limousine type services. But then what we did is we did it start bottoms up where we said, hey, buy an airport pass and now go to your CFO and expense $95. And by the way, it shows up in your credit card as Blom, Blade Urban Air Mobility. So you have some privacy in terms uh, airport transport in terms of how you got there. Uh, and that actually started to, to the point where now we have CFOs and heads of travel calling us. And this goes back to my days when I was CFO of Sony. We made everybody use Blackberries. And IT said, we can't handle iPhones. Eventually, everybody bought an iPhone and we capitulated and say, fine, you can use an iPhone. We'll support it. We'll do this. So you have you can't just go top down. You got to get bottoms up and get users. And right now I'm talking to you from our headquarters, which is right outside what I'd call the, um, the Hudson Yards heliport. We have 50,000 people working, living and recreating, including, you know, Warner Media and um, Warner Media and H uh, HBO and CNN. And we've got hedge funds like BlackRock and, you know, or asset managers like BlackRock and hedge funds like Point72 that have outlets in, uh, in Greenwich. So we are strategically located and New York City is a mega market. Right. And a lot of people say, well, New York City, this and that. It's also 20% of our flyers are international. And that's because people come from all over the world by air into New York City. And then they hear about Blade and that's why Blade has done well you know, in India. The brand worked out well there. And that's why we see a lot of other opportunities overseas. Um, so let's say people are flying into LaGuardia or JFK. They're coming into different terminals based on what airline they're using. How do they get over to Blade? Sure. So uh, with American Airlines, there is an alliance. And again, I mean, again, a lot of it, what I'm talking about is, has been pre-pandemic. We are now reopening a lot of this as the TSA numbers, you know, continue to go up, uh, which we've announced in our quarterly earnings. Um, so with American, you could actually fly American. And then if you buy the service, you know, the five-star service from them and your Blade flight, they will pick you up on the jetway, take you down the stairs onto the tarmac and put you in a car straight to your blade helicopter. Oh, so not only, cool. not only are you saving two hours on the highway, you're saving 20, 25 minutes walking through the terminal trying to find an Uber. Right. Uh, however, if you're other, using other airlines where we don't have that type of relationship with, there is a blade car, you know, again, asset light, but it's our driver branded who meets you at the helicopter, who knows all the roads, knows all the back roads of how to get you to a terminal, brings you to your terminal. Uh, and on the, in, on the reverse, when you land, we have a Blade representative that meets you at the exit of security and puts you in a car that's been stationed and they're talking with a two-way radio. So yeah, it's a, I a lot of times that person that's flying in probably has to go to baggage check still, right? And get their bag. Well, you know, the, the, most of the flyers we work with don't. Okay, uh, so they are they're business travelers. They do. Oh, carry. right. They just have a carry on. And, and for the ones that do, uh, we actually if they have too much luggage for a helicopter, they just give it to us. And we have, again, a service that will bring your excess baggage to your hotel, your home or whatever. And also right. in California, we kind of reinvented the airline. You know, I've spoken to a lot of, you know, movie agencies and uh uh, I'm sorry, movie, uh, movie studios and talent agencies and Silicon Valley companies where people said to us, you know what, we used to not be able to get people to take the red eye. They'd go a day before, book another hotel, have a nice meal. And now we're finding is they're willing to take the red eye because they can land, not get caught in all the commuter traffic in New York, get to their hotel and using their Marriott points or whatever, get early check-in, shower, take a nap and be at their 9.30 meeting as opposed to landing at seven, taking a car and right. then go straight to your 9.30 meeting and looking like you've been on a bender all night. So I didn't think about the partnerships. So you said American Airlines is already a partner. Um, do they promote you at all? Do they promote? Yeah. Blade? Yeah. yeah. So we have a, you know, if you go on uh, the Blade Urban Air Mobility, um, uh, if you go on, on, on blade.com, or you go on YouTube, you can see the American ad that they produce for us that shows the whole process. Uh, also, when they sell the product, they offer this. Uh, you know, again, we're, we're in about a big reboot stage as, you know, we're moving as the airports are becoming more important. We, we paused the airports because of COVID. And what was really interesting, what happened is that our commuter programs 
you know, flying 90, 90 uh, miles away, it used to be a weekend business and now we're flying seven days a week. So actually our quarterly, uh, our quarterly earnings were up, I believe, on revenues 53% versus the prior year pre-COVID. And that's because people were flying seven days. So people took their second homes and made them co-primary residences and, it, and things like that. And now what we're seeing is with this hybrid work uh, remote environment that people are finding it economical, even if they're 90 miles away, to work from home for seven days, then come to the office one day even though it sounds expensive, they've saved so much money on not commuting, doing it that one day, they'll do it, as opposed to before commuting by uh, aircraft five days a week was a little too expensive for most people. So our business went from these really peaky weekend type situations to very kind of like, you know, more moderate usage, but seven days a week. And that's been great for our business. So on the Blade web, uh, yeah, the Blade website, I believe there's a picture of a a plane, you know, a private plane with blade on the side. Um, so once again, is that just part of the whole ecosystem? Yeah, what I would say is that's blade one. And I think it's what's interesting to say about that is that is not a core business. Um, but what we found is that we have so many flyers uh, and they wanted to be able to go to places they go to in the winter, like Miami and Aspen. Right. But there was this huge white space between a $22,000 private jet and an $800 first class ticket on, say, JetBlue. Think about all that space, right? And then we also, because we work with Langone and we have a chief medical officer, we decided and we were the very first air service to have mandatory COVID testing, which we still do on site in our private, uh, right outside our private terminals. So you know that everybody, all your fellow passengers and all our staff, we have our own flight attendants. Uh, having COVID tested. And what we do is we take a jet, a CRJ-200 that normally has 65 people, and we only have 16 seats, eight on each side. So it really did incredibly well, it was done incredibly well during COVID. Our brand partners like this, if you've looked at our presentation, you know, everything from the outfits that our FLIR experience team wears to the alcohol that's served in our, uh, in our terminals, people pay to play. And to have for us the mosaic of being able to offer brands and ability to work with us, including Samsung, which now does our check-in uh, tablets and our tablets on board, who again, these are all pay to play relationships. We, we got kind of a twofer. We got a great service that kept our flyers engaged. Uh, and on top of that, it gives our brand partners an ability to really uh, uh, work with us. So it's not core to us because right now it's not moving to electric. Uh, right now, our focus is on short distance urban air mobility, but it's been a great kind of peripheral business uh, that has been gross margin uh, profitable uh, and continues to grow uh, and that our passengers like. Last question. Um, any thoughts on when the the SPAC merger uh, may close? Uh, I think that, uh, you know, we just filed a, a new S4, a second one with, you know, that reflects comments from the SEC. Uh, and, you know, typically after these, you know, people say in the second time, you know, it could be a month. I think officially we're saying second half, but I think we're in really good shape. And so hopefully uh, we can, uh, uh, that would be faster than that. But I think we're in very good shape in terms of uh, closing this transaction. And assuming it closes, uh, have you guys announced what the ticker would be? Uh, it's BLDE. Okay. Right now, trade under EXPC, right, right. Uh, but it will change to BLDE. Awesome. Anything I missed over, anything I skipped over that you wanted to mention before we close out? No, I, I think the only thing I would, I would also say is that there definitely has been, I'm trying to think about questions that have been asked um, from, you know, prior meetings and such. Um, you know, there are obviously a lot of companies out there building airframes and it's a bet on one. As I said, we're more of an index play. Uh, if you look at, you know, the $10, uh, $10 stock price and the amount of cash uh, that will be raised, assuming no redemptions, uh, the valuation is about Four hundred fifty-six million, roughly, uh, for the company. And so, when we think about some of these more Silicon Valley type valuations for, you know, 
it's not, that's not, you know, we really didn't take that tack. You know, we want to be able to kind of grow the company and have, and we have a business today. You know, we, I feel very good about the fact that uh, over the past two months, you know, we're moving into the end of our third month, you know, a 52 million revenue target for this year, you know, we put that out there. Uh, we have 20, uh, we, we beat our numbers or meet or slightly beat our numbers uh, in the low 20s for this past year. Our quarterly uh, earnings were good. So in other words, our quarterly re revenues were, were good. That was in terms of our quarterly earnings report. And, you know, hopefully it's a, a great year. I think there's a lot of pent up demand. So hopefully uh, the numbers we have out for the estimate for this year, you know, are uh, in good shape, but we definitely see the pent-up demand. We see travel moving to seven days a week. The fact that Europe is closed, I think, will really help our leisure markets. Uh, I don't see Europe opening maybe London by the second half, but a lot of these people may go to Hugo to France or Italy or this. You're going to see a lot of travel with 300 miles. So in a way, we're not only this kind of growth company, but we also have an existing business that definitely plays into the reopening trade. So I think it's uh, an interesting opportunity that we have here. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Really appreciate it. Um, I, I am very intrigued by what you guys are doing. And I agree that rather than, in, you know, playing the, the individual manufacturers in the VTOL space or EVA space, you know, investing in the, plat you know, the platform um, makes a lot more sense to me. So, you know, if you're a believer in urban mobility, you guys are going to be at the center of this, this trend for many, many years. Well, I appreciate that. We believe the same. And thank, well, thank you, you so time. much, Rob. Take Talk care. Talk to you soon. Take care.